Okay, welcome everyone. It's um, Friday and it's time for our first guest lecture and I'm really excited um, because our first guest lecture is a uh, guest lecture from uh, Pascal Bircher, Dr. Pascal Bircher, who's an expert on some of the things you're going to be studying if you're doing 1140. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Pascal. Now, just so you know how, how the technology is going to work today, I'm live streaming uh, as normal, but I've got a Zoom connection uh, with Pascal. And so Pascal is going to be presenting across Zoom, which I capture and send down the live stream. Okay. So from your point of view, everything's going to be much the same. So you should ask your questions in the Teams chat. And um, because I'm just uh, observing the lecture this time, rather than actually giving the lecture, I will um, be watching the Teams chat. So I'm going to give Leo a break this, uh, this week. So Leo won't be answering your questions. I'll be watching the questions. And I'm going to be handing over to Pascal in a moment. So please make sure you ask your questions. It's a great opportunity for you to learn a lot more about what um, you need to know for 1140. And also there'll be an opportunity to ask um, some, some things about the, the game you're playing maybe and how it relates to the theory that you're going to hear in a few moments. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to um, uh, Dr. Pascal Bircher, who's going to um, uh, speak to you. I'm going to, it'll take me just a moment to switch over and I'm going to do that right now. Here we are. And with a bit of luck, you've got a nice uh, picture of his slides, and I'll hand over now. Thank you, Pascal. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. <clears throat> um, hello, everyone. So today's lecture, as you already know, will be on uh, AI in games. Just want to say that um, the slides are heavily based on slides that uh, Stephen Gold has created, uh, because until uh, 2019, he was giving this um, guest lecture instead. So a lot of content that you're going to see is actually developed by him. So this is an overview um, of today's lecture, but I will just skip over it. It's basically just so that's in the slides. So if you take a look at the printout later on, uh, you have a nice overview. Let's start with the motivation. Why are we even looking at um, game playing AIs? Um, one that's pretty obvious is that there are a lot of computer games in um, which you want to play an opponent, which is not a human being, right? You might want to play offline. Um, and these uh, do include um, like commercial video games, like shooters or everything. Um, but um, there are also a lot of board game adaptations uh, for which you can play against an AI. Um, or there are also card games, um, which would not be possible without an AI, right? You couldn't play these card games in real life because uh, some effects are so fancy and complicated uh, that you couldn't do them by yourself. You would need a computer game to play those card games. And for them, you also want to have like a campaign or anything. Well, that should be obvious. Another reason is basically just for the sake of knowledge. Um, so many of you probably know um, the game Connect 4, where you have alternating players. You throw in the dice, uh, um, pieces um, in uh, at the top, and then it falls down. Right? So it's literally uh, um, uh, standing there. You put something on top, and it falls down. And what you want to do? is to get four pieces either in a row, no, definitely in a row, but that can be um, um, uh, diagonally, horizontally, or vertically. And um, yeah, you might just be interested in whether you can enforce a win or not. It's certainly not going to change the world if you do know, but it's kind of interesting to know whether you can enforce a win if you start. And also, how do you do that? How do you have to play to start? Um, so does anybody of you know? I mean, I don't see your responses anyway, and I think there's no time to waste. So, uh, so I think I cannot wait for your extra responses. So I'll just tell you, uh, yes, you can enforce a win. And uh, you can by starting in the exact middle row. If you start in uh, the rows next to it, then you can only enforce a draw, but you cannot enforce a win anymore. Unless, of course, your opponent uh, doesn't play perfect. But that's always the assumption, obviously. If your opponent does not play perfectly, then you can do everything. Um, but if they play perfectly, then it's either a win or a draw or a loss, depending on where you start. It was uh, proven a long time ago. We'll see that later again, actually. And um, another very important, maybe even the most important point, why we regard games, is uh, um, because a lot of real-world problems can be uh, modeled as a game because your, um, your other opponents can just be regarded as other players in a big game, only that it's not about fun. Um, so one example is um, economics. 
where game theory, uh, game theory plays um, a big role. Um, so if you don't know yet what the Nash equilibrium is and what the prisoner's dilemma is, please Google it. Uh, it's really cool. I, I would assume, I didn't, I didn't check, but I would assume there are also cool uh, YouTube videos about that. Um, and the prisoner's dilemma is really interesting. It's not super hard. Um, and it's like the most um, basic example that you learn in the beginning when you study game theory. So look that up. That's kind of cool. And what do I mean with econ economics? Just imagine that you're a company and you want to sell a product. Then you know that other companies might want to sell similar products. You have to make the decision on when to go to the markets. Uh, um, and uh, you can uh, model all that uh, using game theory because all the other um, companies, they, yeah, they are basically other players in the same game. And you want to maximize your own benefit. Um, so that's the real-world application. And another real-world application is uh, multi-agent planning or multi-agent pathfinding, um, which is uh, also in a, a multi-agent environment. And again, you can model the other agents just as other players uh, playing one single game together. Um, although I would like to note that in multi-agent planning, um, most problems are normally cooperative. So the team works together, right? The robots are not fighting each other or have uh, different goals, maybe except uh, robo soccer. Uh, but even in robo soccer, uh, each, uh, each team, again, is cooperative, right? Uh, so that might not fit perfectly here uh, because the games that we're going to look into are actually um, antagonistic, which means that we're trying to beat somebody. So what are games? A game consists of a set of players, at least one, um, right? So there are single-player games like puzzles. Um, <clears throat> and a set of... Something just happened. Uh, um, oh, I played with my pen. <laughs> okay. uh, um, so you have uh, um, a set of moves for each player and a specification of the payoffs, which is telling, okay, if you have a final state of the game, uh, like in chess, your, uh, your king is going to be defeated, right? He's in chess, he can't move anymore. Uh, that's a final situation. And you have a payoff. How much do you gain or lose in that situation? It can be binary, like, well, you lost or you won, or uh, it's a draw, or it can be, hey, you lost 10,000 bucks, or I don't know, you have won the equal amount, whatever, that's a payoff. And you have a combination of strategies. So the strategy is basically telling you how do you uh, choose your moves depending on the moves of the opponent. That's your strategy, the way you play the game. Uh, strategies are also called policies. And there are several restrictions that games can have, right? I mean, game theory, that's, that's science. So clearly everything is well defined. There are certain conditions. Um, and one of them is whether you have perfect information or imperfect information, uh, which basically means, do you know everything or do you not know everything? In uh, the example of chess at the bottom left, clearly that's perfect information because you see everything. At least if you're assuming that uh, you are observing the entire game history, that's why professional um, uh, chess players, they write down all the moves because there are also rules which involve the history. Um, um, but it is because of that, because writing down the history on a well-defined paper, uh, um, you do see everything, so it's perfect information. Uh, the, other, the second game, Scrabble, is imperfect information because um, you do not see the pieces of your opponents and uh, also the pieces... Oh, okay. That's, that's enough. You don't see the, the pieces of your opponent, so that would be imperfect uh, information. Uh, then the number of players plays a role, so there might be one-player games. But normally, if we talk about games, we actually talk about at least two players, right? One wants to beat another. Um, if you have more than two players, then we talk about a multiplayer game. So chess, again, is a two-player game. Scrabble is a multiplayer game. And we have zero-sum games and non-zero-sum games. Today, we are going to study zero-sum games significantly. So a zero-sum game is a game in which the outcome of the um, game will sum up to zero, at least if you scale um, the, the outcomes appropriately. So chess is a zero-sum game, because when I win, then my opponent loses. If I get a draw, then my opponent also gets a draw. So a draw can be defined as an outcome of zero. A win can be defined as one, and a loss as minus one. And, this, and if you define it that way, then you see, well, it always sums up to zero. That's why it's a zero-sum game. Uh, many games are zero-sum games, but not all. Uh, um, 
And uh, in many games, you have like uh, points that you can achieve. Um, but uh, even there, that can actually still be a zero sum game because it might not matter whether you win with uh, um, 12 victory points or with uh, uh, just seven victory points. Um, the one with the most might still win. Yeah, um, but uh, many games are zero sum games, but not all. Sometimes you just want to optimize what you win, like in economics, right? There is not, oh, I win and the other company uh, has lost. So that's, that's not the case. You want to maximize your benefit, your profit. And that's not a zero sum game. And we have games with chance, i.e. where there ha uh, is uh, randomness where versus without chance. Chess is another uh, example, clearly no chance at all, no randomness, everything's fully deterministic. Uh, Scrabble, again, clearly chance, because, why? Right? Uh, because you take pieces out of uh, out of the sack, so you don't see the pieces inside, and that's basically a random process, right? You take a piece um, to replace your last pieces that you've played, and So that's that's what's different technologies depending on what you have. Well, I was talking about strategies and policies. So what is that formally? It's very important. You will see that um, a lot for the entire rest of this uh, lecture here. Um, you can represent the strategy as a game tree. And a game tree is actually rather simple. Uh, um, a game tree is nothing else that, than the complete specification of everything that can happen. So um, at the top here, below the three dots, you see some intermediate state of the game tic-tac-toe, where you have to get three uh, axes if you're the starting player in a row, diagonal or, or vertical. Uh, so horizontal, vertical or diagonal. And um, what you do here is that given um, a current search node, which belongs to one player, you draw all the, um, all the moves that that player has and you create um, the respective successor states. And for each of these successor states, you again draw all the moves of the new player and create again a set of successor states and so on and so on. And you can do that until you have a complete game tree with all the possible states that you can generate and with all the possible moves of all the possible players. It's just a huge tree like this. And if you analyze that tree, then you can infer a strategy. This is what you see here with the bold errors. The bold arrows here indicate what the respective player would do. So um, the first bold arrow shows that, yeah, we're going to um, choose the middle move. Well, clearly, because um, if the X player has a choice between three moves, and there's one move which will directly, uh, directly lead to the win, then clearly he's going to play that. Uh, we have the same situation on the left for the O player. The O player would not play the O um, on, uh, on the rightmost middle um, fields because if he does it um, on the very left middle field, then he wins directly. And that way you can analyze every single state and get a strategy. And the strategy would essentially be the entire tree because the entire tree would tell you how do you play depending on the move of your opponent. Um, the problem is that these games can be, um, or most games are actually super large um, because it's a tree. And uh, a tree has the property that it is exponential in uh, the depth of the tree. And what is the depth of the tree? Well, clearly the depth of the tree is the horizon of the game, right? Because every single move to the bottom is a move in the game. And so the depth of a tree is the number of moves then that a game could last in total. And the branching factor of the tree is the number of possible moves per game state, which can also be high. It's probably not just three, like in tic-tac-toe, normally you have way, way more uh, options. And that means that you have a huge tree of exponential size. And constructing such a tree is very often not beneficial. What are we looking for? I cannot talk about games without um, um, talking about a very important differentiation, and that is between aiming for a game AI, which is just some uh, policy with a certain property, and the game theoretical outcome. So uh, a game strategy might just be a policy, as you have just seen, and that might not have to be perfect. In fact, maybe it should not be perfect. Because if you're, uh, if you're developing a game AI, you do not want to design um, 
an, a, a policy, a game AI that beats your opponent all the time, right? You wouldn't play a computer game in which you are being beaten mercilessly. Uh, um, that's not fun. Uh, you want to be challenged, but you want to win as well. Uh, so it's important to have uh, policies of certain strengths. You don't want to have a good policy. And uh, you don't want necessarily you have the best policy. Or just, you want to have a challenging policy or even an easy one. If you want easy. It's um, of whether you can guarantee um, to win if everybody plays perfectly. And that's different from a perfect policy. It's not different from a perfect policy, but it's different from an incredibly good policy. Like in Go, for instance, there will never ever again um, any human player that will beat a game AI. There will not, no chance. Uh, um, but uh, um, it's still not proved. We still don't know, as, at least as I know, uh, at least as far as I know, it's still not proved whether the first player can enforce a win in Go. We don't know that because it hasn't been proved. Just because we have an insanely uh, strong AI, it doesn't mean that, the, that we know whether we can enforce a win if everybody plays perfectly. So that's uh, that's an important differentiation. And uh, um, yeah, a few other um, um, vocabularies that are important here, um, or one actually, is rationality. And rationality means that um, you're assuming that um, everybody plays perfectly under the assumption that all the others play also perfectly, but for themselves. Um, so uh, consider a multiplayer game with like three people, um, and your move might depend on whether everybody tries to optimize their own benefits or whether others collaborate just to beat you. Um, and we are assuming here rationality in the sense that people uh, want to maximize their own benefits. It might even make it, uh, in non zero sum games, it might even make a difference whether they try uh, to minimize your benefits or whether they try to optimize their own. Right? That's a difference. In, in non zero sum games, that's a difference. Um, so if you assume that your opponents always tries to maximize their own, then your strategy is a different one uh, compared to you assuming that they hate us and they really want to minimize my own benefit. That could be, uh, um, but that's not rational. Um, and here we are always assuming rationality. I mean, if you don't, then you need to change your algorithms and put this into your algorithms. But for this lecture, we assume rationality. Um, yeah, so if the game tree is sufficiently small, then we can deploy uh, certain uh, algorithms. Um, and one of them, one of the most important one, is the Minimax algorithm. You cannot learn about games without learning Minimax. It's literally always the very first algorithm that you learn. And Minimax is a game to solve uh, zero sum games. That's important. Remember, zero sum means if I win, the other one loses. If uh, I get a draw, the other one also gets a draw. Um, and if you have such zero sum games, then um, then you can essentially talk about a player max and min. The max player, let's assume that's me, I'm the max player, I want to win. And the min player, of course, he also wants to win, but because it's zero sum, you can also regard the other player as the min player who wants to minimize my benefit. Because if I get a minimal benefit, the other player will get a maximum benefit, just because it's zero sum. And that's why it's called uh, Minimax, because that has the uh, great advantage that you do not need to uh, remember two different game outcomes, namely the outcome of me, the max player, and the outcome of my opponent. But instead, it's sufficient if um, I only represent one outcome, because that's symmetric to the other. Right? Again, if I win, the other one loses. So you only have to remember one outcome. And this is the algorithm here. So... Um, Let's try to get the annotation activated. So um, what you do here is um, if a state uh, is a leaf, then you can already return the payoff. So you know whether, um, um, whether you have won or whether you have lost. So, uh, we are considering the outcomes from the perspective of the max player. So if max wins, the outcome uh, would be one. And if max loses, the outcome would be uh, minus one. That's the payoff if you have the terminal node, the leaf nodes, in which the game has ended. And uh, we will be exactly that. That's the return value. Um, that's here we want to return at the end. That's the outcome of the game. 
And if we are in a current state which is not a terminal node, then we generate all the successors um, and uh, take into account their final value. But if I am uh, computing a max value right now, then that means it's the max player who doesn't know uh, doesn't move. And if we assume alternating moves, which we did or which we do here, then the next value or the next state will be evaluated by the min value, right? The other player. And because of that, um, the value of the entire game will be the maximum of what we have achieved so far plus the value of the next node. But the next node is going to be under control of the other player, and because of that, we are minimizing. So we enter the other uh, function. And the other function does exactly the same, right? If it's a terminal, we, repair, uh, we return... Uh, the outcome, and if it's not a terminal, then uh, we, because we are the min player, we choose the minimum outcome. Um, but again, we have to evaluate again all the successor nodes, which are again under control of the max player. So it's always a back and forth. That should be pretty clear, I hope. So let's look at an example. Let's go back to a uh, minimax. Uh, we don't know yet the V value here. Oh, uh, sorry, I should activate it again. Okay. Um, here, that's the V value, which we don't know yet because it's not the terminal yet. So we expand it. Now we get three successor notes. One thing that I would already like to say, uh, because it might seem a little bit artificial, I'm just doing that. Um, it's, it's a small example. You see here already in the middle. Okay, you see here all. Okay, no, it works. You see here already in the middle that this is a leaf node, that's a terminal node. So you might wonder why don't we uh, write down um, the value yet? And there's no real reason. In fact, in the real world, if you would implement that, then you would write down the value. You would start write down that this is a node that makes sense. Uh, um, and you would even say, okay, then we don't have to continue search because max player is in control of the move. We have found um, a node which leads to a direct win, so we end here. So I understand this might seem artificial, uh, um, but there's actually an uh, algorithm which does exploit that. So here, I really just, for the sake of the argument, and to illustrate the, uh, the, the algorithm, I would like to explain how this is normally done and or how you can do that. And that is uh, I, um, uh, going down the tree in a left mode function. So uh, we just assume that uh, this node here has not been uh, generated yet. I just draw it so that you see it already, but it hasn't been generated yet, and therefore we don't know the value yet. Uh, um, and instead, we generate them in a left to right fashion and evaluate this whenever it's time. But of course, if you would actually... Um, implement this, then you would do this early on. You would just check whether there's a terminal right away um, because then uh, you can just incorporate information quicker. But for now, just ignore that and we um, evaluate the tree in a left to right fashion. So let's remove this again. Okay, so we have uh, generated these successes. So we go to the left one. Uh, that's now a min node. It's not a terminal. So we need to go down the, uh, the tree again. So we expand the successes. And now the left node, uh, leftmost successor is um, a terminal node, and we can write down the V value. It's a loss for max, because max is the X player, so we can write down minus one. And so we again continue to evaluate the tree in a leftmost fashion, so now we need to take a look um, at this node here, it's not a terminal, so we expand it. Um, now we have um, again a value, it's a draw, and now we can propagate that up, Works. So um, this clearly will also be a zero. Now we go up. What do we do now? Here we have min value. So what does min do? Well, duh, it selects the minimum. <laughs> so we get a minus one here. And then we continue to the right. Uh, this one uh, will evaluate it. We see it's one. Then again, we go to the right and it expands. So let's see whether I was lying or not. So it's a zero, right? It's a minus one, great. Uh, it's a run, great. And now we continue the tree, we expand, leftmost, expand, propagate upwards, great. 
um, again, leftmost, which is now this one, expand, propagate upwards, propagate upwards, propagate upwards. So zero, one, zero, and max one. Great, we are done. And we have proven that uh, in this game state, which we see over here, where the first player has its turn, we can enforce a win by exploring the entire search tree. And as I said in the beginning, meh, that didn't sound really smart, right? We could have stopped here. And there's an algorithm which does that in a really smart manner. Um, and this is what we're going to uh, learn now. In particular, because you saw that we just visited every single node. And I've said in the beginning that there are exponentially many. Because if we have D moves, um, I mean, in total, right, that's the game horizon and the game ends and the branching factor of B, meaning that every player in each state has at most B moves available. In tic-tac-toe, it was nine branching factor. We have nine choices, although you might eliminate symmetry. Um, then you get an exponential on time. If you look at the space requirements, then uh, if you recall what I just said, I told you that we are doing at first search, which means we only need to store uh, the current path in memory. And if you only store the current path in memory, oh, I think it's not synchronous anymore. Okay, that's odd. Um, okay, no. So if you, um, if you store the current path in memory, then the space requirement is only linear, right? Because, well, the path is uh, the game horizon. And for each state in that path, you have to store all, um, all possible moves. And this gives you B times T, which is a linear space requirement. But the problem is the exponential one-time requirement. Um, and in order to compensate for that, in order to allow... Um, to not explore the entire search tree when you have situations like before where you can already conclude that it's pointless to go into certain parts of the tree, there is this very famous uh, algorithm called alpha beta pruning. So in alpha beta pruning, we remain two values. Uh, the alpha value, which is um, the best one for max, and the beta value, which is the best value for min. Remember that in minimax, we always only stored one value because it's symmetric, right? If uh, the outcome for me is uh, 10, then the outcome for the other is minus 10 because it's zero sum. But here we're doing it slightly differently. Uh, um, the alpha beta values uh, really store the best value for the two players. So alpha is the best value for the max player, the one who, wants, who starts the game, who wants to win. And uh, beta also wants to win, but uh, from the perspective of Max, it's the min player. And beta is the min value, the best value that min can achieve so far. And um, some people always have trouble understanding that, uh, um, uh, that algorithm, because of all these different values and how they interact. Um, so please remember this here. That's really important. Alpha and beta propagate down but the actual outcome propagates upwards. I think if you understand that, if you look at the graphic that I've produced, then hopefully alpha beta will be more easy to you. Now let's see how it works. So it still looks kind of similar like uh, Minimax, but now we are being able to prune certain parts which are completely pointless. So um, until here, it's pretty much still normal uh, Minimax, um, but let's assume that we are um, in, a, in a tree. You will get a nice graphic soon. Uh, um, so that's max player. And we have um, um, here um, evaluated our search node here, which is that we, right? Because we are going down here with min, that's a recursive call. And we got a value V. So we got a value V for that. And that means that Max is being able to produce at least this will, uh, V value here. We know that, right? Because we, well, we just computed that. We know that Max can at least get that V value. Um, but this was called with alpha and beta. And what is beta? Beta is the best value that min can enforce. And now think of it. If we know that the min player can enforce 
a value which is smaller than what Max can enforce here, then Max will never have the opportunity to even play that. Right? So again, we know beta is the best value of which is coming from the top. That's why I told you, remember, alpha beta comes from the top. And if we know that we know that beta here, the min player, can enforce beta, but beta is actually smaller than what Max can play, then we know that Max will never even have the opportunity to play his move. Because if beta is smart, then he will choose the tree that will lead to beta. And if Min will um, play the move that will lead to beta, then we know that the Max player will not even have the choice to play this move because he will never even see that state because it will just not happen. And this means that we can return V right away because there, right? Because we know again, it doesn't even get to see that state because beta will never give me the opportunity to. And that means that all those uh, other nodes here on the right, you don't have to look at them because you know it's not going to happen anyway. And for, um, for Min, that's uh, just the same. And I gave you a graphical illustration again. So let's now assume the first player is Min. And it uh, doesn't really matter. It's just an example. Right? It's, everything is completely symmetric. It can also be part of a bigger search tree. right? There can just be uh, the child of another uh, search node. It doesn't matter. So let's assume we have this Min node here. But let's assume the game started. So since the game started, we are initializing alpha and beta with the default values minus infinity and infinity. So we are going down here. Uh, let's say no pruning occurs yet, just for the sake of argument. And we can evaluate that uh, this move here is worth five for min. That means that min, if, if he wants to, min can play five. Min plays the left move and it gets five. And that means that we can store five in the beta value. And now we get into max. Um, with those values, which are propagated downwards. Let's again, let's again assume there happens nothing magically here. We just evaluate the entire search tree. Um, and we know that we get uh, V equals 2. So Max knows that if Max has the opportunity to get into the state, then it can play the left move, which will get him to. Now, let's assume, well, Max wants to do better, right? Because so far, Min can enforce 5 on the left. Um, and Min wants to lower that. Min wants uh, to drop 5 to 1, maybe. Uh, um, and therefore, Min might want to play the middle move here. Max doesn't want to only win 2. Max wants to win more, at least 5. And so it goes down here with the new values. And now let's say that, again, no magic occurs here. And we find that, hey, cool, Max can do 7. What does this tell us? This tells us that... We never need to look at this path here on the right because Max will generate at least seven. But if Max generates at least seven here, then we know, oh, darn, uh, um, I will never get the opportunity to play my move, to play my seven move, because Min can already achieve five. So Min will not go down here to let me get play my seven. It will choose the left five. But if I know that I will not even have the chance to play the seven, then clearly um, I don't have to look for a bigger value than seven. So again, if you have trouble understanding minimax, look at this example. I think that's a very nice illustration. I, I hope it is. I hope it is. Uh, um, and so if you actually implement it, just take a look at the pseudocodes and uh, then you're basically done. Okay, I quickly uh, um, click through um, an example, but I will make it quite quick because I think the pseudo code says already everything, and we also have the illustrative um, examples on the left. Um, so you can also look at this example um, offline because, of course, I will make the slides uh, available also with all the intermediate steps. So you will literally not miss out on anything if you just take a look at the slides later on. So let's assume this is our start state. Uh, we initialize them. Oh, yeah, maybe one important note that's even important for you if you implement an AI. Uh, um, in the general algorithm, 
I was initializing the default values of alpha and beta with minus infinity and infinity. But if you know the actual maximum, then you can define that. Right? In this game, we know that we can either win or lose. So it's either, uh, either uh, minus one or one. So the algorithm actually becomes smarter and better if you tell that the, uh, to the algorithm. So instead of minus infinity, give minus one. And in the game that you have to model, you can do the same. Uh, instead of uh, initializing it with minus infinity, you might actually initialize it uh, with the values that you can actually achieve uh, maximally that might help. Okay, so we have uh, minus one and one here because we know that's the minimum and maximum. Uh, so we generate all successful nodes. And again, for the sake of uh, argument, I assume here that uh, we uh, generate them ad hoc. So the middle two nodes are actually not yet generated. We just remember that we need to generate them and we go down the hill on the left. If you're actually implementing that, then this is not the best way to do it. But instead, you would directly uh, um, uh, um, check every node, whether it's a terminal, and write down the value because that might speed up the process. I can tell you why afterwards. I have a question, Pascal. Yes. A uh, question from Claire. Um, and the question is, what is the most effective way of handling cases where a player's turn can be skipped? Maybe, I'm not sure we, we want to answer this question right now. We can do, delay this question, but I just thought I would uh, mention this question yeah. being asked. So it's always hard to talk about efficiency. Uh, um, um, efficiency basically comes into place uh, when, uh, when you're evaluating heuristics, uh, which I will talk about later. So I think uh, what's important here is the question how uh, to achieve correctness. Uh, um, and if a move can be skipped, then that's just another move, right? Uh, uh, so if you have the choice to do your five moves whatsoever, you just implement those five moves. But skipping a move is actually nothing special. It's just another move, uh, all right? You just give them a special semantics, but it's still just another move. It transforms one game state into another. So even if you can skip moves, um, that's nothing magical or nothing special. It's just another move. You just have to take uh, um, a look at how to actually do that. Like, just, I mean, just like here, you have a move placing an X, so you have to write down how that new successor state looks like. And the skipping move is exactly the same, only that the state doesn't really change. So that's, that's what you had to do. Um, um, yeah. yeah. Thanks. I can also... Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, so uh, we here, so we we are going down now on the left because it's not a terminal. And um, yeah, this is a terminal now, so we know it's we. And uh, um, so the min node uh, compares to the alpha value, um, and the alpha value here is minus one. So if I, I hope I don't embarrass myself. So I believe that we are now checking whether. The V value is smaller than alpha, I guess. Uh, um, yes. And that is the case, right? So we are comparing. Uh, um, and we see that uh, the V value that we've obtained here is smaller than uh, the best case of alpha. And because of that, we do not need to go down here. Right? And that means this is not even generated. I was just writing it down so that you see how much we are saving. But in fact, none of them is ever going to be generated, right? There could be 10 more um, uh, siblings and there could be huge uh, um, uh, subtrees. You never need to look at them um, because of this equation, which tells us, well, we know already that uh, this is a perfect move for min. So there is no point to make it better. Uh, um, so... Uh, yeah, now we can uh, continue to propagate uh, the V value upwards. I've actually already done this. So now uh, here we already see the upwards propagation step. And now we go uh, to, to the next uh, sibling here where we do exactly the same. So now it's max, which means that um, the best value achieved so far, which is minus one, is going to compare uh, with the better value. The better value can now be updated. Uh, because this is one loop, right? That's the loop of the max value. We have computed this, so we were being able to update um, the um, the beta value, um, and so we are doing that comparison, um, and we do actually see that now um, the equation holds. 
So the uh, V value is greater than the beta value, which tells us that, okay, we found the maximum, we cannot do better. Uh, um, and because of that, we can eliminate the complete right subtree. Well, the word eliminate might actually not be the best uh, because we never even generated in the first place, right? We don't know whether there is just one sibling or 10 siblings or whether the sibling that is coming has again a thousand nodes uh a thousand nodes behind it uh yeah below it um or just a few we don't know because we are never ever going to uh, generate it in the first place and now you also see um why it's uh, um uh why it would have been beneficial to um check whether a node is a terminal right away instead of doing it lazily, as I did. Because if in the beginning, when we generated these three nodes, we would have evaluated all of them uh, directly, which was not possible here, and it was not possible here, but it was possible here because it was already a terminal. And if we would have written down V equals one right away, then we could have already seen that, um, well, this equation holds because beta was actually even our initial value. Um, and therefore we would have not we also would have saved this part of the search tree and this part of the search tree, which is intuitive because clearly if you are um, uh, the max player and you have a move which leads to a direct win, certainly you're not going to look at other options. You're going to play that move right away. And this is what alpha beta pooling can do. What you also learn from this example is that the ordering might play a role, right? Uh, so the ordering of siblings. So if you start with this, ah, sorry, I changed... Yeah. So if you start with this, uh, that's a better ordering than if you would have started with this. Um, so you might want to start with a subtree which is smaller, um, because then you leave uh, you lead to a terminal quicker. Pascal, I have a, another question from online. Um, yep. Now the example we, we you just walked through was with the tic tac toe and and uh, with only three states: zero, uh, one, and minus one. Um, and the question is from Mikhail, and his question is. Is there an efficient way of prioritizing winning by larger margins? It seems this, meaning what you just demonstrated, this will take the first win it finds. Uh, yeah, uh, it doesn't matter. A win is a win. There is no margin. Um, right? I mean, it doesn't, because uh, this is the game theoretic outcome here. That's not a strong AI. That's the perfect AI. Right? And it doesn't matter. Uh, so let's assume you have to uh, win with the most points. And whether you win with uh, just one point difference, although you're collecting 10,000 is as good as winning with 800 um, in advance uh, compared to the other. There's no difference. That's the game theoretic outcome. Right? So I, it doesn't I, matter. My, my guess is, is that Mikhail is, is concerned because this example only has the three states. Um, um, and uh, when you described it earlier, um, of course, it was fully general, so it would go to just it would just always take the highest or the lowest, and it would always take the winning, winning value, no matter whether it was um, a, a three state game or one with lots of lots of different um, lots of different values. And so, I think that the answer is it'll always take the win. It doesn't matter which win, as yeah. long as it's a win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so, there are it really doesn't matter. So, yeah. so, so the only thing that matters in minimax is efficiency, right? A win is a win, no matter how high it is. Uh, but it does uh, make a difference whether your uh, AI runs for two minutes or for two years. Uh, um, and the difference can be, the, the difference is efficiency, right? Which subtree do you visit first? Um, uh, could, but, could, could I, um, could I uh, say another thing maybe? Um, so if we can imagine a game of chess or something, maybe maybe in the space, space of possibilities, there's a spectacular way of winning and a boring way of winning. This will just find the fastest way to find a win, not any particular win, it, any win, the first one. And so it's all about speed. And so it doesn't matter if it's a flashy win or a, or a not so flashy win, it'll find the first one. And it's about finding that fast as it possibly can. And that, then so that, maybe that answers Mikhail's question. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's, that's a good remark. Um, uh, only note that um, it, it finds uh, the first win according to a lot of strategies. Uh, so, it really, so you can improve this in various ways depending on how you do it. The result might be different, but it's always optimal in the sense of it's a win if there is one. Okay, I need to speed up a bit. Um, but this was really the most important part because you need, probably you need to implement that. So the rest is basically just for fun. This is the part that you really need to understand. So um, I hope I'm allowed to speed up the rest. 
Sure. This was really the important part. Um, yeah, so this is just a remark that you should never implement Minimax, never ever. Always use alpha beta because it leads to the same results. Alpha beta is just smarter. And actually, there's no overhead, right? There are just two values. It doesn't increase the complexity. So Minimax is basically just to learn what's going on, but you would never ever implement that. There's no reason for this. So um, this is also important, um, how, to, how to model game, uh, games with chance. Uh, um, and uh, in a game with chance, you can model the environment, which is producing the random outcome. Uh, I wrote here random decision, but actually I don't really like that. I should change this in coming, uh, coming years. Let's say that's the random outcome. Sorry for bad handwriting. <laughs> That, that's better, because there is no decision here, right? If you're throwing a dice, then you're just throwing a dice. There's no decision, there's an outcome. Uh, um, and this outcome is essentially the environment. And you can model that as yet another player. Uh, um, because you're playing against the outcome. You're playing against your dice, right? And so the dice, you need to anticipate what the dice is doing. And uh, dice is uh, various um, possibilities, like one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, just like your opponent has various possibilities, there's no difference. So you want to beat both of them. Uh, in fact, um, a very interesting, I think, uh, similarity is that um, uh, non-deterministic problems are uh, semantically equivalent uh, to antagonistic problems because an opponent is nothing else than uh, randomness. Um, so the question is, um, what kind of player is the other player? And there is a difference. So the other player is certainly not, uh, so the, the random player is certainly not another max player, because if it were another max player, then that would be too, uh, um, uh, too optimistic, because certainly you're not always getting the outcome of your dice which you wish, that's not going to happen, uh, so it's not a max player. It's also not a min player, because sometimes you are still lucky in life. Maybe not as often as wish, but sometimes we are. And if you model uh, the randomness as another min player, then you're never lucky. In fact, always the worst case will happen. That's too pessimistic. That's also not realistic. Uh, um, and so, um, again, no, not again, but uh, instead, what it will be is we assume rationality. So you need to account for the respective probability. So if you throw a dice, you have six outcomes. Each outcome has a probability uh, one sixth in case of a dice. Uh, um, or if you have an unfair coin, it might be two, three heads and um, one third tails. Um, and then you have the respective uh, outcome for that uh, uh, respective yeah, outcome. Or you have the payoff for the respective outcome. So this is, uh, this is what you would do um, if uh, you're dealing with uncertainty. You, take, uh, you model another third player uh, and that third player... Um, would neither be a min player nor a max player, but instead it would be um, a player in which the outcome is the weighted sum of the probability times outcome. A very quick example. Um, by the way, um, this is a standard notation in minimax trees. I just couldn't do that before because I was drawing down the states. Uh, so if um, so, such a triangle is a max player, such a triangle is a mixed player. It's just a convention. Uh, um, and yeah, what you see here is that first we have the max player with all uh, the moves of, of it, and then we have another um, wand player which implements that move. And um, in this, what you see here is, uh, um, for example, in Settlers of Catan, a very amazingly cool board game uh, um, in which uh, you always have to throw two dice and the sum matters. So you um, take the sum of those two dice. So uh, the sum might be um, the sum might be two. Uh, which just has probability 1 to 36. The highest probability when the robber or thief comes is a 7, right? There's two dice. The highest likelihood of a sum is a 7, uh, which happens in, uh, in a sixth of all cases, uh, um, and so on. So you just, and then and you just continue with the standard algorithm here, right? You, you just evaluate the final outcome. The only reason, uh, the only difference is now you have three players, essentially. And the one player takes into account the likelihood. So the outcome here will be multiplied by that. And that's the only change you need to implement, and then you can even solve uh, games with chance using the minimax algorithm. No other difference. 
Oh yeah, <laughs> that this game uh, appears here is actually one. Well, I should have moved that. Sorry for confusing you. Uh, uh, so there's no chance in this game. That's the current assignment. Uh, um, so if you didn't take a look at the very well description that Steve has put together, uh, um, uh, just like in yeah, just like in chess, you have uh, two colors and two sides. Uh, you start here and go over there. The opponent starts here and goes down. Um, and uh, you can um, you can move um, one by one, uh, which flips the top of the respective uh, dice, and you can al also jump over dice. So um, the black five are starting here and can jump over there, there, and there, um, which would be considered one move. It could also stop here. That's another thing if you implement that. Um, so um, black here has a lot of moves right here, one, two, three, five, six, seven, and so on. And if the five is here, it has one move, two move, three moves, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven moves uh, for the five. Um, so if you implement that, uh, take into account that it might uh, tactically be better um, to maybe stop somewhere for whatever reason. Um, and... I think I would implement that with minimax, right? There's no animus involved, no choice. There are dice, but you're not throwing them, so there's no animus. Um, it's, I would say, I, I, I personally, I would probably try to implement that with minimax. Um, so yeah, that's why it should not be there. It should actually be here. Or maybe there. I didn't actually calculate how large the stretch space is. I'm not sure if this is a small game, which can still be solved by uh, alpha beta. Oh, did I say minimax? I meant alpha beta. Uh, um, not sure if this is a small game which can still be solved by alpha beta, or whether this is a large game where you need to do something more fancy. I would probably try with, me, uh, with alpha beta. Okay, damn, I need to speed up. Uh, um, okay, and, and folks, we'll, we'll, we'll um, keep going, um, maybe going over time. If you need to leave um, because you've got another class, no worries. This is all being recorded, but um, better to get to the end of this, um, even if we go a little over time. Okay. Yeah, uh, I might actually still be able to finish because I was on purpose staying longer on the alpha beta because you're most likely going to implement that. Uh, um, and the rest is not even that technical. I'm basically just giving an overview and some examples. So it's quite realistic, actually, that I still hit the time. But yeah. Okay, so alpha beta, in the worst case, still performs exponentially. There is pruning, but whether pruning occurs depends on the current game and on the ordering. Uh, of the tree, but in the worst case, it still has the same runtime as minimax, at least asymptotically. Um, and so for some games, even that might just be too large. So let me just give a few examples so that you can make a comparison. Um, in um, in tic-tac-toe, the rough maximum of, with rough, that's, yeah, a max, rough maximum, an upper, um, number of states that you can produce is uh, roughly 20,000, but that includes invalid states, which is just 3 to the power of 9. So that's that's an upper bound. They are less, actually. Uh, the actual maximum is this, which is nothing. It's 5,000. You can compute this in 3 milliseconds. Uh, um, but uh, you can even reduce it further, because clearly there's a lot of symmetry, right? I mean, just uh, imagine this one. You would actually have 9 situations. Ah, uh, no, wait. Uh, 4 situations. One, two, three, four. Four situations, but they're all equivalent, right? So this is the same uh, um, as this. There's no difference. So symmetry elimination is important in many games or in search in general. Uh, um, yeah, and if you um, eliminate uh, uh, symmetries, there are only 765 states, so that's literally nothing. Um, but that's just the states. That's not the games. Uh, and there are like uh, approximately 27,000 possible games. And What's a game? A game is a complete outcome, right? From the beginning to the end, and that's a path. So that's not even the tree, that's just a part of the tree, because that's a path. Uh, um, yeah, but still that's uh, um, laughingly small, so you can definitely solve that if you implement that on a modern computer. Uh, we saw that in the beginning. Uh, so a rough maximum is already pretty insane. That's uh, 1.1 uh, uh, times uh, 10 to the power of 20. Um, but you can uh, reduce this um, if uh, you include various symmetries. Some might still be present to five or four point five to the power uh, to ten times the power of twelve. Um, and although this is already rather large, um, actually not sure that alpha beta can solve this on a modern computer in a decent amount of time. Um, 
Um, this was proved a long time ago in 88 independently, right? There was no internet yet, uh, by two different people. Um, it was not alphabet pruning. Um, but uh, today, oh, there it's written down. Yeah. Today it can be solved by alphabet pruning because our computers are so much more efficient. Uh, earlier they used different technologies. You can actually just read this up on Wikipedia if you're interested in how they proved that. So this, so we know the grain theoretic outcome, but I already told you that. Blockos, a very cool game. Like uh, If you're into board games, or even if not, I can recommend it. Really cool game, it's quite fun. Uh, um, I'm not sure, I think it was even an assignment a couple yep. of years ago. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, um, and this has just an insane search space. Um, so there are a whole bunch of pieces, which you see here, of four different colors. And you have to place them in the edges. Uh, um, so just in the beginning, the first player already has 58 moves. And the second player, I actually double-checked the math. I mean, the example is by uh, Steve Gold, I said. Uh, but I checked the math, and it turns out, uh, uh, it's, of course, uh, all correct. So even the second player then already has uh, 58 moves, depending on the left search tree, and 116 moves uh, if uh, Blue plays this. And it's just the first move of the second player. And the search space just explodes. Uh, so this is just the first couple of moves. In the beginning, 58 moves. Uh, then yellow one, as his first move, has that many moves. Remember, that's basically the branching factor. Uh, uh, well, not the branching factor exactly, but that's the, the number of nodes in the second layer. This is the first move of red, and then this is the number of first moves of green, and when blue has, again, uh, its move, we don't even know. Um, and that's just the second move, right? So the search space, it's just, you cannot deal with that. Uh, and, and a lot of games or problems are actually on that, uh, on that kind. Um, a few statistics on chess. I'll just skip over this so that we can finish in time. Uh, goal has quite a high uh, search space. Uh, um, like, super high, but still, uh, there is AI which was solving this successfully, which we're also going to touch in a minute. And that's the question, how to, do, how to deal with this, if we just cannot apply alpha beta anymore. Um, and we do that by not going to the leaf nodes, but instead we um, estimate um, the effort. And chess is a nice example where you can, uh, where you can just stop. So let's assume that uh, we do search until that node. So this is not where we start. We started above in the search tree, but we cannot proceed further because the tree would get too large. So we stop here. And then we need to evaluate that with a heuristic. And what we could do, and this is done in chess, is, well, a pawn counts one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, six points. A knight and a bishop counts uh, three, uh, so zero. Uh, a rook counts five, so, oh no, also zero for white, and a queen also zero counts uh, nine here. And you do the same for uh, for black. Um, so here we see that black has seven points, white, uh, white has six points. Okay, black has an advantage. That's what you can do. Don't wall it out to the end, but apply heuristics. And this uh, can even be learned by... Uh, machine learning, which has a bunch of uh, features, and it learns um, a vector. So which feature is how important? So you might already see this is pretty much the same as in chess, only in chess it was uh, years or centuries of uh, expert knowledge, but machine learning can learn this autonomously. And another algorithm, uh, which I can uh, only state here, uh, this is the best video that I have found when I was studying this. Uh, so maybe you want to take a look, uh, is um, another algorithm which simulates games. So it selects um, a leaf node, which is not a terminal, so it's a leaf, but the game didn't end, like in chess. Then you expand it, and you simulate it. So you don't build the tree, but you make random moves until the end. And then you get the feedback, uh, you get the outcome based on your random game, and you feed it back. Um, that's the back propagation part. Um, that's an incredibly successful um, um, search procedure, and that was actually used in Go. Um, yeah, and then start with minimax. I already said that we end at the lease where we get the payoff. 
But if the tree becomes too large in order to get there, then instead we need a cutoff test. And a cutoff test is a test that tells you, well, now I really don't feel comfortable going 20 levels deeper. Instead, I will compute my heuristic value for the current node. That's a cutoff test. And then you apply your heuristic, which you might come up with by yourself. That's actually a lot of fun, I think, to develop heuristics. Um, just briefly want to mention the horizon problem, which is the question of when to do the cutoff tests. Because if you do it too early, you might run into problems. Um, so I think that's the situation from earlier, where we said that black is a bit better. But actually, uh, if you play chess, then you know that uh, one turn later, uh, white can get another queen and will therefore get another eight points because it will transform a pawn worth one into a queen worth nine. So the horizon problem is the problem of determining when exactly to do the cutoff test because it might be just too early. And that concludes the lecture. So last slide, uh, just a very short success story. In 59, uh, we had the first uh, checker, uh, checker playing uh, AI. In 97, uh, we had the first chess AI, which was beating the world champion. In uh, 2007, checkers was solved. And so with solved, I mean the game theoretic outcome. Um, in 2011, uh, Jeopardy was winning, which required um, an ins yeah, quite a decent amount of uh, language understanding. And in 2015, there was an AI which was uh, learning to, uh, to play Atari games completely from scratch. So uh, you didn't explain them the rules, they just learned it on their, on their own um, and were then um, basically perfectly. And uh, in 2016, uh, the world champion Lee Sedol uh, was being beaten uh, in the game of Go by AlphaGo. And just a few years later, uh, that AlphaGo uh, was beaten by AlphaZero, uh, which also learned other um, games. And before I conclude this, I want to say there is um, a documentation on that. Um, so it's a long movie, so approximately 90 minutes on AlphaZero and about, um, yeah, this entire event, how Lisa Doll was beaten. Personally, I loved that movie. It was it was so emotional and also interesting from an AI perspective. Um, so maybe the next movie you can watch is that one that I believe you should be able to watch uh, find on on YouTube. I found it really interesting. Um, that concludes the lecture. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, thank you very much. I'm clapping on behalf of 120 people online. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got one question and one point for clarification. So I'll just. Uh, the first question is from Adnan, and he asks, what are some strategies for coming up with heuristics? Does it kind of just depend on how well you know the game? Um, yes and no. It definitely helps uh, to attend the course on artificial intelligence, uh, because there you will learn about search and how heuristics can be done. Um, so um, you might also ask that question again in uh, the forum. Um, I think um, Steve still needs to be uh, to get me access to that because then I can answer in more detail. Um, a very short question is, well, expert he uh, knowledge helps, obviously, but there are also so-called domain-independent techniques to come up with a heuristic, which relax the problem. Yeah. Uh, one example is if you are in a road map and you want to find the quickest roads to somewhere, then you actually have connections and you know you can take this street for 10, this street for 30, uh, but instead you can just assume um, the straight line distance, which is an approximation of the real world. So you might do problem relaxations, which throws away certain um, information of the game and makes it easier. Um, that would be a technique, but I can elaborate that in a written fashion if I get access to a forum and you ask again. But Fantastic. great question. Fantastic. And there's, and there's a close follow-up to that, and that is, what, uh, this is from Claire, and she asks, what is a good way of testing whether a heuristic is better than another? Oh, also excellent question. Um, excellent. Again, attend the AI lecture, um, or um, I gave a guest lecture. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I gave a guest lecture on AI planning. Uh, um, I should have the recording online, I believe, not entirely sure. Uh, you would find it on my website, uh, uh, because there I explained that. Um, so there, um, heuristics can have properties. Um, basically, there are two important properties. One is admissibility, which means that it will never overestimate the true distance. And 
straight line distance is such an example. Um, if you do the straight line distance estimation, then this can never be worse than the real distance. Because in the real world, you cannot be better than the straight line distance. Uh, line distance. That's admissibility. And you can check whether heuristic is admissible. And if heuristics are admissible, i.e. never overestimate the optimal length or cost, um, then uh, you can check heuristics for dominance. So you can try to prove mathematically um, whether one heuristic is dominating another, which means that it will always lead higher values than another. So, um, but you, you would have to look at the precise example whether this is the case or not. Uh, um, but for th some heuristics, you might be able to see that if you do that problem relaxation or that problem relaxation, you will see that the first problem relaxation will always lead to higher estimates than the other, although both are still admissible. And then you basically know that you can throw away the other. Great. Um, now, we'll, I think we'll just finish up with one question for clarification. This goes back uh, to when you were talking about al alpha beta pruning. And the question is, uh, th th there was a suggestion that um, okay, it says if the alpha and beta values are set to the biggest and smallest possible win, then it will stop at the biggest win or the biggest loss rather than the first win or the first loss. Excellent. Right. So, so it will find that it will I'm not stop the sure. first let me, one. Let me get on teachers. The yeah, I think all this. I, I said I said I didn't think that was true. Sorry, we got, we got Zoom is glitching on us. I I said I didn't think yep. that was I didn't said I didn't think that was true. I said I thought it would always stop at the yeah, first th win or the first loss. Yes, I think uh, I think there are more details about that. I think uh, um, it's not even uh, I um, uniquely defined what that. I, I think hmm, I think the answer is more more complicated. I would like to get that answer again in a written form. Sure, uh, because I think there are some subtleties here. Uh, um, I think the real answer is rather technical. Also, what it means, the first win versus not the first win. Okay. Um, but what you could take a look at um, was look into the example again of tic-tac-toe that I provided and look what happens in the middle nodes if we do not set the values to minus one or one, but instead minus infinity and infinity. And if I recall correctly, it will not stop there because it will not know that this is the best value. Um, it, it will continue, and only if you then get to another win, um, then um, it's uh, it will stop. That that's what I meant. Uh, but if you if you set the values like this with the best and worst case right away, then it will definitely stop there uh, already. Because why should it continue? Great. Well, I think with that note, um, I'll just say one administrative thing, and that is that. Um, Pascal has offered to answer questions on Piazza. So what I will do is I'll add Pascal to Piazza and I will create a post uh, tagged with 1140 assignment. And um, there'll be an opportunity to ask, uh, to follow up questions there, which would, uh, which, which would be fantastic. And with the, on that note, I'll just read out a couple of uh, things that people have said in the chat. They've said, excellent lecture, great fun to watch. Thanks so much. And um, yeah, and people have said thanks for this. So, so thank you very much, Pascal. And with that, we'll finish up. Thanks again. Cool. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Also, to you, Steve, for inviting me.